Hi, thanks for joining us on demand today. I'm so honored that you have taken time out of your busy schedule to spend some time with us. If you are new or just haven't had a chance to connect with any of us yet, go ahead and text welcome to the number on your screen. We would love to get to know you. We'll send you a little gift and just see how you can be a part of Gold Creek. What I love so much about Gold Creek is that we have things going on all week long, whether you're online or in person. We've got connect groups all throughout the week. You can join us in the chat on Sunday. We've got on demand throughout the week and plenty of other opportunities for you to join us. If you are ready to take that next step and see where you fit in, go ahead and text connect to the number on your screen. We would love to get you plugged in. I believe you have taken this time to come listen to the message that we've prepared for you. God has something special for you in this message. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get on into it. All right, good morning, I'm there. Oh, cool, all right. So, true story, right here in Federal Way, something pretty awesome happened. It, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't recent, but it was fairly recent. There was a Walmart employee, and this Walmart employee had cart duty. If you've been to Walmart or Costco or any place, you know that there's people that gather all the carts that are left all over the place. So this particular employee, that was his job for the day. And he goes to grab a cart from this couple, and as he's taking the cart back to the cart stall, he notices that there is an envelope in the cart. He grabs the envelope and opens it, and it is just stuffed with cash. Now, he has obviously one of two choices, keep the money or give it back. And without even hesitating, he runs back to the car, slaps the car, you forgot this. And he hands them this envelope full of money. Turns out that the envelope had $20,000 in cash in there. This couple had just withdraw, withdrew this amount so that they can put it towards the down payment on their house. And had they lost this, it probably would have destroyed their deal. They were extremely grateful, obviously, as any of us would be if we lost $20,000. If you're like, eh, $20,000, whatever, I need to talk to you afterwards because we've got a building that needs to be built, okay? But $20,000 is a lot of money, and of course, they were super thankful, and they just asked the employee, please, can we give you a reward, even if it's just 100 bucks, something, and he kept saying no. So then they said, well, let us take you out to dinner. Let us just celebrate that you were able to do this for us. And he said, no, it's okay. He kept refusing the reward. And when they would ask him why he did this, he just simply said, the money never belonged to me. It was always yours. And that's why he returned it. He just believed in being a trustworthy employee. And he actually won the Integrity Award for Walmart that year. I didn't know there was an Integrity Award, but he won it that year, which is just an awesome thing for him. Let me ask you, what do you believe about God and his faithfulness to us? Do you believe that he trusts you? Do you trust him? These are all questions that we're going to wrestle with, and I believe that a lot of times when we're blessed, sometimes we overlook the idea that God is providing the blessings, and sometimes when we don't have as much as we think that we should, we blame God, thinking, God, why have I not gotten as much? And I know that we've come through all of that in different parts of our lives. So today we're going to start with some scripture in Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. It says this, Isaac planted crops in that land. This is the next scripture coming up here. Isaac planted crops. I couldn't say it right. Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. Today we're going to talk about becoming a family that God can trust. What does that look like? What does it mean for God to trust us? The previous scripture that I just read may not make sense without some context. Good news for you. I'm going to give you some context here in a second. But before we look at that today, before we get into why this scripture is currently there, why the scripture was written the way it was, let's quickly talk about the hang-ups for why we have trust issues in our hearts, why we seem to, to look at God with certain lenses on, and then when things don't happen the way we want, we just rip off those glasses and say, God, you don't care. What is it that helps us determine value or lack of value for all that? Because how we think about our legacy, how we think about our financial legacy, how we think about what we're going to do here on this earth while God gives us breath in our lungs, well, see, that's the key right there. 
There's a lot of common approaches to our legacy, and not a, these aren't necessarily bad. I'm throwing that disclaimer out there. These aren't bad reasons for wanting to do these things. For example, the first one, providing security for my family. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. You want to provide for your family. But I believe that God wants you to provide for your family, but he also he doesn't want that to be the number one priority in your life when the Bible clearly says that he is supposed to be the number one priority in our lives. But that's one area. The other is that it, hope we want to create unique experiences and opportunities for our family. That's what we want. Or maybe we want to give a leg up for our future, for our kids. We want to provide for them. I read another story right after this one where there was a man that he had buried like Fifty or $60,000 in the walls of his house. He just hid it so that when his kids inherited the house, they would find it, which sounds like a great plan, except when you drywall over something, I don't usually walk into a house and go, let's rip out all the walls and see what we find. So the next person that bought it actually tore down the walls because he was remodeling, found all this cash. It's rightfully his, by the way, but he calls the kids and says, I found your dad's cash. And if I were in his shoes, I would want my kids to have it too. So I want to give, these, give this money back to you guys. That's trust. That's generosity. That's just a different way of looking at things. And sometimes it's not easy. And I understand that. The idea of giving or even finance is a tougher concept in our spiritual walks. Because we love control. I love control. This is something that, that I understand. I get it. Because I realize that any amount that I give away is an amount that I no longer have. That's the basics of giving. When you look at it from what I have and what I don't have versus who can I bless. See, perspective is everything. And we get stuck on this idea. I know that I have. My heart has become overprotective with what I had. And honestly, when I did that, it made me think about God's provisions even less when I tried to protect things and say, no, 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 God, you can have everything but this. I relied less on God. So today, as we talk about how does God bring provision, the first way that he brings provision is through the supernatural, through just circumstances that are out of our control, that we had no idea was happening, and it just, it just happens. If we go back to Scripture, remember the context that I was going to give you? Here, let's get started. Genesis chapter 26, verse 1 through 3 and 12 through 13. It says, now there was a famine in the land. So we're setting this up. There's a famine. What does that mean? There's no food. Is that a big deal when you need food to eat? Yes. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar. The Lord appeared to Isaac and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Then verse three, stay in this land for a while and I will be with you and I will bless you. See, God promises something here in this moment. He says, I want you to trust me. Trust me. I've got you. But in order for you to experience the fullness of what I'm trying to do, you have got to fully embrace that you cannot control the situation. But if you do, I am making an oath right now that I will bless you, that I will take care of you. What does Isaac do? He has two choices, listen or don't. He listens and follows. And it says in verse 12, Isaac planted crops in that land that God showed him. And that same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. The man became rich and his wealth continued to grow until he became very wealthy. When I say supernatural, this is not something that he did. In a famine, planting crops is not going to usually yield a hundred times, let alone double. God was doing something amazing. And I find myself asking this question all the time. Do I believe that God will provide? I mean, really, do I really believe that in my heart, in my core? Not the concept of it, but true faith. Do I believe that? I've struggled with that for many years. I really did. And when I became a pastor, I still struggled. Do I really believe that? Because it's hard for me to let go of that dependence of that, that I've got control of this. And I understand that. But what does that do in our hearts? It creates inconsistency. I understand that inconsistency. I had that same one until I moved here. I had no idea what God was going to do. And I just said, you know what? When we moved here, my wife and I, we just, we said, deal breaker. We are not going to skip giving what God has given us back to him. Every single month, 
It is the first thing that gets taken out of our, our paycheck every single month, well, twice a month technically because it's biweekly. But we did that. We had no idea what was going to happen when we moved up here. We knew no one. Zero. It wasn't until after we moved up here that I ran into old college friends and, and Alyssa knew someone from college and it just like it was, it was random, but we knew no one. And God is telling us to plant a church, to plant a campus, and all of a sudden we're like, what? But can I tell you something? God always provided. He did. It started with the launch of this campus when we found Lake Stevens and God spoke into my heart, Lake Stevens, and then when 13 families trusted God and they went with us, they didn't trust me, they trusted God because they didn't hardly know me. And then it continued as we grew and then we had an opportunity to buy land, so we did. And then through COVID, you guys know, we were the wandering Israelites through COVID. For two and a half years, we jumped around everywhere. Now guess what? He's still providing. He's still watching out for us. And there is nothing that I did through this process. I did nothing other than make myself available when he told me, James, a.k.a. Isaac, go and do this thing and I will take care of it. And I said, absolutely, God, I will go and do. And he took care of it. What does that mean? It means that God has supernatural favor on us. And when we trust him, when we have faith in him, it creates a supernatural trusting between the two of us. Hold on, I got logged out here. Let me log back in. All right, so the next point I want to make is that through strategy and good decisions, that's how God provides, sometimes through adversary or adversity. I know it's tough. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But if we read in Genesis, continuing that story, it then said, then Abimelech said to Isaac, move away from us. You'll become too powerful for us. So Isaac moved away from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar where he settled. Then here's the key part. Isaac reopened the wells that had been dug in the time of his father Abraham, which the Philistines had stopped up after Abraham died. Verse 19, Isaac's servants dug in the valley and discovered a well of fresh water there. Sometimes it's through the supernatural that God just, just does a miracle, and other times it's through strategy and good decision. And in this circumstance, it's strategy, good decision, and adversary, because he was asked to leave. Remember, there's a drought. I keep saying that over and over again. There's a famine, there's a drought. This means that water is in short supply. He is in a land where everyone is struggling, but he's in a specific place where at least he has access to some of these things. No water means no crops, which means no livestock, which means no money. That's how they bought stuff. They didn't have money that they could exchange. They traded stuff. I will give you 60 pounds of grain for your goat. Sweet, let's do it. And that's how they did things. And he's in this land, and he's, he's, he's thought he had favor with Abimelech, and he did technically. But then Abimelech asked him to leave, which isn't a great feeling, but does he mope and go, oh, man, God, where are you? No, he doesn't. He decides to try something. He says, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig into these wells at my... My dad used to have. I wonder if they're still operational. I wonder if they still work. I mean, it'd be a lot easier than digging brand new wells because then you got to figure out where there might be water and then you got to dig and hope that you find it. And if you don't, oh, you just wasted a couple days. That sounds terrible. He knew that at one point this has water, so he did take a chance, but it was a very strategic chance. The likelihood that there still would be is there because the Philistines covered it just out of, out of I don't want to say spite, but they were essentially trying to push out these people groups so that they can take over the land. But God trusted Isaac to handle this very important resource like water. In a desert, water is the biggest commodity. And sometimes I wonder, God, why have you trusted me with so much? I wonder that. Do you ever wonder that? God, why did you trust me with blank, whatever that is? I mean, I have four kids. That's a lot of kids. I'm asked to pastor this church. God, why me? I keep asking that all the time. Not in a whiny way, like, oh, why me? God, someone else. Not like that. But what does God see in me that I'm not seeing? What is that thing? Years ago, I had a student who, um, man, he, every week, he would come up to me. And he would say, 
Pastor James, man, I want, I want to desperately reach out to my teammates. He played baseball, and he was fantastic as a baseball player. And he came up to me, and he just said, I just, I just want to reach out to my teammates. They're, they're so far from God, and I just know that, that God's going to do something amazing if I could just, if, if they just, they just give them a chance. And I said, cool, well, what are you going to do about it? And he's like, well, would you come to the team and do this? I'm like, nope. What are you going to do about it? And he says, well, I don't, I don't know what to say. And I'm like, I wouldn't worry about that. I said, I would just make myself available and let God do what he does. So he trusted me, and he starts speaking about why he believes in Jesus. Like he started putting, you know, crosses on his, on his tape bands, and, and he would do the little Ixthus fish on his other tape band, and when they would be like, what is that? And he'd be like, oh, this is my, this is my, my representation of that I want Jesus to go with me wherever I go, even on the ball field. Well, why'd you believe that? Because he changed my life. Well, how did he do that? And then he starts sharing his faith, and all of a sudden these guys are like, huh. And it was really cool because... Every day that he would go to practice, he would text me or call me and say, hey, I got a chance to talk to this person. Guess what? You know, my friend Matt, he's going to come to church next week. And I said, cool. So then he'd bring Matt and then oh, my other friend. And he just started becoming this voice on his team, a positive voice. And man, he was scared. I'm not going to lie. He was freaked out. He was stressed out that he was going to just be ostracized. And in a team setting, chemistry is huge. And he was a starter, so he didn't want to upset the chemistry. But he trusted what God was going to do. And eventually his team started responding and his best friend started coming to church. And he got to, uh, my, my, my student got to sit with me as I prayed with his best friend to receive Jesus. And it was one of the coolest experiences for this young man's life. One that ignited something in him. He, after that moment, he was like Mr. Evangelist. Like he didn't care who you were. If you were already a believer, you got saved again. Like he got that good. And he started doing these things and helping church plants. And after he graduated from high school, he gave up baseball. He could, have, he could have had a career. But he decided that he was going to pursue Jesus. And he started helping church plants. What happens when you experience Jesus on a level like that where you trust him? And then he comes through. There are different times and different places in my life that I've experienced provision so then I start asking myself this question, why does God bring provision? We know how he does it, but why does he do it? Well, the first reason is to benefit our sphere of influence. If we go to Genesis 26, verse 20, it says, The herders of Gerar quarreled with those of Isaac and said, The water is ours. So he named the well Essek because they disputed with him. And then in verse 21, Then they dug another well, but they quarreled over that one also. So he named that Sitna. He's digging all these wells, and is he reaping the rewards? No. These other people lay claim to it, pushing him out, so now he's going someone else in, or somewhere else, and he keeps digging new wells. But his faith, his trust that God told him, go to this land, I'm going to provide for you, and then he starts digging these wells. Yay, there's water, we're going to be just fine. This people group comes in, it's our water, and rather than continuing to push back or even war, he says, you keep it, I'll find another one. And he goes to another. This could easily seem like a negative moment in Isaac's life, like, God, why did you bring me here? You told me to come here, and now everything that I've worked for, you, these guys are taken away. This great moment is gone because of fighting. But if you looked at this same scripture differently versus, oh, this poor Isaac, oh, man, this, this resource that he needs, he dug two wells. Oh. If you look at it differently, yes, they were only momentary provision, but it provided long term for other people and allowed them to survive because of his faith. Isaac was settled in this land with some of his people and some outside his people, but he was in this land. And his faith benefited all of them. If he never came, those people group don't get that water. That's a big deal. My wife and I have always had this um, our home is God's home kind of philosophy, even when we first got married. 
Our first home had four bedrooms. It was just the two of us. I don't know why we needed four bedrooms. I remember even looking at the house going, what in the world do we need four bedrooms for? And then you find that you fill them pretty quickly. We had one room was the guest room, and then one room was the office. Of course, one was our bedroom. And then one became like our game room, which we dubbed the Elvis room because we painted it purple and hung up Velvet Elvises everywhere. I don't know why. We thought that was cool, or I thought that was cool, but we did it. We had a treadmill in there. It was good times. But we always, even when we owned that house, we, we said, God, however you want to use this home. And, of course, we hosted many, many events there, and we had students over all the time. But then... A little while later, my brother needed a place to live. So I was like, cool, take your pick. Door number one, two, or three. One of them will destroy your eyeballs, but the other two are normal. And he picked one of the rooms, and he stayed with us. And then I had my old roommate. He was in between places because he was getting married, and he didn't want to you know, buy a house yet because they weren't sure we were going to go, and blah, blah, blah. And he's, he's kind of in this weird little, little limbo spot, so... He's like, well, you know, I'll just couch hop. I'm like, nope, got an extra bedroom. Come stay with us. He had his own bedroom, but that's just where he kept his stuff, and he always slept on the couch. Drove my wife insane, but whatever. And then all of a sudden, it started making sense. I was like, oh, that's why we had so many extra rooms. Because you were providing for, for them through us. And since then, every other place that we've lived, we've still had that same philosophy, and he's given us other opportunities to bless people as well, too, where they just needed a place to live, and they stayed with us, and it just, it's been awesome the way that God has used this resource. But it starts with trust. It starts with whether or not you trust your God with the things that he has given you, your finances, your opportunities, your resources, your home, your family, your time. Do you trust God with all of these things? Because if you don't, that's where that disconnect happens, where you're wondering, well, what does God have for me? What is it that you're, that's holding you back? What's keeping you from fully trusting God? The second why is a reminder of his character. The first was to benefit the people around us. This one is a reminder of his character. Goes on in verse 22. He moved on from there. So he just had this quarrel over these, these, these wells, and he moved on from there and dug another well, and no one quarreled over it. He found one, finally, that they would leave him alone with. From there, Isaac moved to Beersheba, and where the Lord appeared to him on the night of his arrival. And God says this to him, I am the God of your father Abraham. He says, do not be afraid, for I am with you, and I will what? Bless you. I will multiply your descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will do this because of my promise to Abraham, my servant. He is reminding Isaac of his character. God is saying, I am going to take care of you the way that I took care of your dad. He is showing us today who he is and how he provides. Isaac could have been frustrated. I've been moving around. I've dug how many wells? At least two. After I've dug them in my own land, by the way, these hosers come over and they're trying to take my wells. I could have fought back, but I didn't. I just kept digging new wells. I trusted you, God. And what does God do? Each time he takes that step forward, he finds success. Each time he, do, he did these apparent random things, God showed up. And what's awesome is if you keep reading, other people notice this as well too. It says in verse 28, and they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. He's reminding us of his character right here. That God will never leave or fail us. These are words that he gave to people like Isaac and to Abraham and then later to Jacob to remember that his character is one of faithfulness. I have a friend. Uh, God just blesses financially. I mean, I, there's no other explanation other than God just has favor on him. I mean, everything this guy touches or invests in or anything just multiplies and grows. It is bizarre. And I believe that it's because God trusts him with those blessings. He does, and for good reason. He is one of the most generous and humble people that I know. Just ridiculous. 
And what I love about this guy is he was recently blessed with a huge sum of money, just a giant big ton of money. And I didn't ask him how much, even though I was massively curious because he's a friend of mine. And I didn't ask him specifically how much it was, but I knew that it was enough to buy a couple homes. And I was like, whoa. So then he took this money and he went to his church and he sat down with the elders and he says, I want to give this money back to God. What should we do with it? And I joked, you know, I have an answer, actually. Why don't you move up here and make this your church home, and we'll use that to build a church. And he, he just laughed. And I was like, I'm kind of serious, but yeah, let's laugh about it. But I wasn't really too serious because that was his church home. I didn't want him to leave his church home to do that. That's, that's what he's, he's called into that place. That's where God is going to have him minister. And absolutely, God's going to do something through him in that church. That's easily seen. But what I love about that humility is that he trusts God. He trusts God with what God has given him and that God trusts him in return to take the stuff that God blesses him with to use it for God's kingdom. That's what I love about that story. Not that, you know, he's just a humble and amazing guy, but the fact that he took what God has blessed him with and he just flipped it back around and said, you know what, Lord, this is yours. What would you have me do with this? But we have to ask ourselves this question. Am I a person that God can trust to bless? That's the question that we have to to really wrestle with. It's the one that I've been wrestling with. So if I'm wrestling with it, you're going to do it too. Because if I have to suffer, so do you. Everyone loves, you know, misery when you're in it, right? But are you digging? Where are you digging? The allegory of that is, are you following what God is saying? Because if Isaac decided that he wasn't going to go to the land that God showed him and he's just going to dig wherever he wants, would he have found the same success? I don't think he would have. But where are you digging? Where is that place that God has placed you in? Is it the right place? Are you listening to him? If given a chance, God's going to use you to influence people and their lives. I promise you this. If you fully trust him and let him do this. And the question has to be, am I willing to let God redefine my family, my trust? Some of the other pastors and I were kicking around this question. We were throwing it at each other. And the question was, if God blessed you with 10 times the money that you have, who would benefit most from that money? And we all just kind of wrestled in that question. We were like, okay, so if If God just 10X'd my salary just overnight, who would be most blessed by that? And I have to admit, I thought myself, I'd be the most blessed. And then, of course, my my pastor conviction came out and I was like, oh, that's the wrong answer. If God has blessed me with that much, I need to be a blessing to others. And that was what I wrestled with for this last week. I have enough. And my selfish nature always wants more. Always. But who benefits from that? Me. I need to flip that script. And I need to answer that question. And say that if I were to be 10x blessed, then I would not be the most. But the people around me would be. How do we get there? It's by trusting God. It's by trusting God with the little things. It's by trusting God with the big things. It's by trusting God and listening. And when he says move, we move. When he says go, we go. When he says stop, we stop. That's how we do those things. And I, again, I'm not going to, I've been sharing my struggles this whole time. This has been an area of inconsistency and struggle for me. And maybe for you, this is an area of inconsistency or struggle as well, where you trust God with everything inside of you, your life, your kids, your family, your job, your finances, all of those things that you're just, you struggle with. Control. I, I don't know, God. I don't know about this tithe thing. I don't know about this giving thing. But what if that's the one piece that you're missing? That that unlocks faith in you that you've never experienced before. I know it did for me. When we said that that was a non-negotiable when we moved here, not one month has gone by where we have not tithed. 
In over seven and a half years, we have not missed one. Why? Because I trust God. And it has unlocked so much deeper connection to him than I've ever experienced. I don't think that's a coincidence. So today, we're going to close with worship as we have been the last few weeks. And Dave and the band, <laughs> Dave and Manu are going to come back up here. But as they prepare and get ready to go, I want you to think about something. Has this been an area that you've been missing out on? If you grab the program, inside the program, there should be a little QR code, and it says the 90-day challenge. That is something that we started years ago at Gold Creek, and it's, it's kind of a safety net for you to help you start trusting God more. And if the only reason that you haven't given your finance to God is because you're not sure if you're going to have enough, here's your opportunity. Because what happens is every dollar that you put into that 90-day challenge folder, we keep to the side. We don't spend it. We don't put it in our budget. And at the end of 90, if you just feel it didn't work for me, I wasn't feeling it, I wasn't spiritually connected to God, we'll give it back to you. We'll give it all back. So it's a risk-free, try for 90 days kind of situation, right? I know it's very infomercial, but it sticks. I encourage you guys. Here's an opportunity to start. Maybe you can't get to the 10 yet. You just want to start with, well, I just want to, I want, I want to start giving. Just, just to prime the pump a little bit. Here's your chance. Release control. Let God have every part of your body every part of your spiritual life, every part of your, your emotional and spiritual health. Let God have that. And then watch as he transforms the way that you think, the way that you see others, and the way that you bless others. Try it. You have nothing to lose. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, I just pray right now in this room, those watching online, I just pray, God, for this moment of, of the 90-day challenge. It's, it's our way of coming alongside our, our friends and our family that, that this might have been an area of struggle, of control, and I get it, Lord. It was, it was hard for me. And I just pray right now, like in this moment, that they take a step of faith and they release this, that they commit to giving back to you, that they commit to helping you continue to spread your word here in Lake Stevens. Help us, Lord, to be faithful for our hearts, Lord, so that we can be a family that you can trust. And ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me as we finish the song?
down. 